What's up, YouTube? Welcome to this next episode on So You Think You Know C Sharp. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at a for loop versus a for each loop. Now, the for loop is just going to be a small little portion of this. Really, the focus is going to be on the for each loop and how it works and what happens under the hood and how you can make your own classes that you can use within a for each without them being collections of some sort. Right? We all know that we can use any collection within a for each loop, but I want to show you there's some other tricks up the c -sharp compiler. Essentially, the duct typing, if you saw my previous episode, I sort of hinted at it. So we're going to see some of that occurring in the c -sharp compiler. It's called duct typing, it's called structural typing, it's called pattern matching. It's got different names to it, but I'm going to stick to duct typing. <laughs> All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is the performance difference between a for and a for each loop, right? And then we are going to have to try and explain what we see or what our findings are to get us better sense of, okay, so, so one is faster than the other, but like what's going on? Why is it faster or slower? To try and explain or justify the reasoning behind the differences in the performance. So I've got a very simple application here that I'm benchmarking. And I've got one benchmark method that is using a for each loop with a, with a predefined collection. So the timing does not include the creation of the actual collection itself. It just, iterate, it just includes the iteration through the collection. And then my baseline is the one, the one with the for loop. Same thing, it's already the collections pre-initialized. It's not part of the timing, all right? So if you were to look at the test results, the benchmark results of this, I'm gonna run this, it's gonna take a few minutes and I'll be back. All right, so the benchmarking is done. There are a few things that I want you to sort of pay attention to. One, because we set up the, the for loop as the baseline, in the ratios column here, you'll see that the for loop is one, and then because this is two, it implies that this is twice as slow as the baseline, which is the for loop. So the for each loop is about twice as slow, or the for loop is about twice as fast, depending how you want to see it. The other difference is that the for each is allocating memory, while the for, for loop is not. So, and that's another reason for why it's slower. And we're going to be digging into what that memory allocation is, why the for each is slower, and what's really going on under the hood. All right, so, so much for the, the benchmark. Now, when you're trying to understand what the what happens at compile time or after compilation, the benchmarking is happening with the code execution and in release build. And so it implies that the JIT compiler has already sort of kicked in and the JIT compiler may have done its own optimizations at the, at the time of JIT compiling. For example, most language compilers have a optimization for for each for four. That is what's called loop unwinding or unrolling of the loop. And it works kind of like this. If at compile time, you can decide or determine the exact number of iterations within a loop, then rather than having a loop actually specified in the generated final generated code, it has unwound, unrolled the loop, and so if you're going in the loop 100 times, it's gonna actually write the line of code 100 times, like with the different changes that occur. Different compilers have different capability with regards to that optimization, but I wanna just keep in mind that moving forward, we're gonna be looking at IL and Compiled C sharp code, but not JIT compiled. The JIT compilation step happens only at runtime. So the benchmarking results are showing kind of what you would expect to get in real world applications. What we're seeing in uh, IL is the non JIT compiled code. So just keep that in mind. There are a few tools that you can use to decompile IL. Right? So once I build the application here and there's an XE, I can then use various tools to kind of reverse engineer that IL back to C-sharp. Now for what we are trying to do, we don't actually, we would like to have a tool that takes the IL and produces the rawest raw C-sharp code, meaning that's a C-sharp version two code rather than C-sharp version seven or eight tools because the language features are adding that magic and we want to see kind of the raw version of that C-sharp, not the, the C-sharp version that has the magic in it, if that makes sense. And there are different tools. There's IL Spy, which is a free tool you can download from the marketplace, from the Visual Studio Marketplace, and it'll install into Visual Studio, and you'll see me using that. There's a beautiful website called SharpLab, sharplab.io, where you can copy paste some C Sharp code, and as long as it can compile it, it will show you a decompiled version of that or a C Sharp lowered version of it. It's unfortunately also very smart, as a result of which it's not showing you the real lowered code, but we'll try and 
make use of a couple of tools like this to get a better sense. And eventually we can also just go down to IL and see if we can decipher from look, by looking at the IL what's actually occurring in C sharp at the, the C sharp level past the compilation step. The rest of this video is trying to be trying to explain why the for each is slower than the for loop. And maybe from all of this, you might say, you know, maybe when I can use a for loop, maybe I should use a for loop. And then I'm going to leave that up to you. I would suggest only in cases where the slowness has shown to cause a problem. If you're building some framework level code that is in a hot spot, meaning lots of times being called, you know, thousands and thousands of times, and there has been demonstrated issues, performance issues, switch over to a for each for loop and see if that speeds it up. Of course, memory allocations also take place with a for each loop. So maybe you want to be smart about that in hot paths. And so typically only in hot paths should be looking for some sort of optimization at this level. All right. So, okay. So I'm going to take all of this code and I'm copy, going to copy paste it into sharplab.io. And there it is. And what you're going to see here is that this is the code I pasted in, sort of our original code here. And then this is the code that has been produced after, let's say, a compilation step. So you can see here that the for each benchmark method has been converted to something a little more than the original, which is over here, right? This is what we wrote and this is what it became. Right off the bat, you should be able to take away that a for each loop does a couple of things. Most times it does a couple of things. One, it uses the get enumerator method. In other words, whatever this thing is that you want to iterate over has to have a method called get enumerator for it to start working. And then it puts it in a try finally because the enumerator typically is an I disposable. And so it's going to try and dispose it if it's an I disposable because of the way the guidance is behind implementing an, an enumerator is that it needs to make copies of the original data so that in case you're multi-threading or whatever, the copies cannot affect each other while iteration is going on. So it's thread safe. So it depends on the implementation really, but that's the guidance. And as a result, you might want it to be a disposable. So once you're done with that iteration, you can dispose of it and it's not holding on to unnecessary memory allocations. Inside the try finally, we have a while loop and this is how it works with any enumerator. So when you have a get enumerator, the enumerator itself has these three met three properties. One is current, the method called move next, and another method called reset, which is hardly ever used. So you'll see it over here. The move next returns a bowl. And so if it can move next, it'll continue on. And then once it continues on, the current property will give you the current item, and then you can use that within the loop. So your code that you wrote like this with the for each gets converted to code that is like this. The for, this is one way it gets sort of lowered, if you will, in C sharp. Right? Your for each becomes a while loop with the try finally. But it's a little smarter than that. Actually, it's quite a bit smarter than that. What if you were using an array instead of an I enumerable, which is what we're doing here. So if I were to now make this, let's say here I did uh, two array, you'll see that the same for each has now changed to using a simplistic for each. But this is not really a simplistic for each. This is where I said the tools don't tell you the full story. They don't tell you the correct story, if you will. They're trying to be smart when they decompile the code meaning from IL back to C sharp based on language features and everything else. They're kind of, they're trying to get back to the language feature that we have today or the language version that we have today and the features that that language version has, which is not what we want. We wanted to show us the raw code. Really what's happening here is when it works with an array or a list, rather than producing a, using the get enumerator method and the try finally and a while loop is going to actually use a for loop, right? So, the for each loop can either be lowered to a try finally with a while loop inside it and the get enumerator method being used, which is a expensive method as in there's an allocation taking place right there. Or it could be converted to a regular for loop because it knows it's working with an array or a list. All right, so that's the uh, optimization. So that's two different things that are going on at the time of lowering with for each depending on what's happening. What is the get enumerator? Now, there's guidance behind how to implement it. Of course, we have a feature in C Sharp since 3.5, version 3.5, called the iterator pattern that is implemented using the yield return 
and it makes it very, very simple for us to implement and are innumerable without having to go through a lot of, lot of work, right? So if you want to know how it's to be done, I've made a video many, many years ago, I think in the C sharp. So you think you can C sharp, uh, so you think you can link <laughs> about seven, eight years ago. And I forget whether it's a part one or part two thing. It's probably part two where I talk about implementing our own enumerator and seeing what it takes to do that. And that's kind of like what's happening here. So anytime you see, for example, here in the compiled version of the source code that it says it's doing a get enumerator like that, this is not a free method. This is a lot of work. This creates a new instance of another object each time you do a for each. And then that object has to be garbage collected, as well as the fact that it's doing that work and it's in a while loop with the try finally, with the dispose, all that adds to sort of the performance problems, if you will. Not problems, the slower performance as compared to a for loop, right? Now this get enumerator method here is also pretty cool. One would think that this get enumerator is probably because, you know, there are innumerable interfaces, I enumerator interfaces, and you have to implement in your classes, you have to have this imp class implement the I enumerator and the I enumerable interface for it to work here in a, as a for each loop. So I'm going to take this method here. I'm just going to write this here in, back in my code. <laughs> we have to make this true, right? And if I look at this get enumerator here, you'll see that the enumerable interface has a method called get enumerator, and the get enumerator method or uh, interface is a whole bunch of uh, other methods, the move next and the current and everything else I was talking about. So that's all showing up over here. Um, this is the enumerator of T. So if you look at that, here we are. So every enumerator has a current property, a move next method and a reset method. But for the most part in .NET, C Sharp at least, nothing actually uses the reset method on a, a numerator. But if you're implementing the interface, you need to implement that. Maybe it's doing nothing. Maybe it's an exception that's up to you. Most things don't actually call it. All right. So then one would think that if you wanted your own thing that you wanted to for each over, that you would have to implement the enumerator interface that requires the enumerable interface and so on and so forth. And that's true to some extent, as in you have to do that. I mean, you don't have to do that. If you did that, it'll still work with the for each, right? So what I have here is a movies class and a movie class. So that's my movie class. It's going to collapse this. That's a singular movie. And I also have a movie collection class, meaning it's called movies. It doesn't descend from a collection. It does not implement an enumerator or enumerable or any of that stuff. It's just a standard POCO class, right? That actually doesn't implement any other interface or descends from nothing else. I want this class to work with the for each. Now, given the name, you can assume that it is got a collection. In this case, movies. So it's it's a it's not descending from a collection. It's not in aggregating a collection per se. But I wanted to work with the for each. So what I really want to do is something like this. I would like to be able to do here, for example, I say movies equal to new movies, right? The the plural, if you will, the collection. And then I'd like to for each our movie in movies, right? The this one. That's what I want to do. Now you can see already that it's actually working. As in there's no the compiler's not complaining because I've already done the implementation. And this is where the duct typing comes into play in C sharp. The one and only case I know of, and of course I'm not, I'm not sure that they call it duct typing. I think they call it structural typing or pattern matching or uh, delayed something or the other. It doesn't matter what it is. All I'm saying is one would think that this for each would probably expect you to have a class that implements the enumerator and enumerable interfaces. And that of course makes sense because that actually works, but it's not actually required. All it takes for you to be able to use a class in a for each is to have a get enumerator method on that class. That's it. And this is checked at compile time. Okay, so at compile time, it's not looking, the compiler is not looking to see if that class implements some interface. The compiler just says, does this thing have a method called get enumerator with this signature? That's it. And once you do that, you're home free.
So what I've done to implement that literally is I've got a method here that says get enumerator is public. In this case, it returns an I enumerator of movie, and that's how I've implemented it. I don't have to have so many items in here, so let me just reduce the number of items so you can kind of see it all together. But I then want to show you the compiled code for this so you get a better sense of what's happening. So that's what all I've done. Now, this is a feature in C Sharp 3.5 that was uh, given to us in C Sharp 3.5, the iterator pattern with the yield return. So now it's a lot simpler than if you look at my so you think you can link video. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. However, I'm going to show you the kind of work that needs to be done by sort of decompiling this from IL back to C Sharp so you'll get a better sense of what that is. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to copy this into sharplab.io. So if I scroll down a bit more, this is all called the get movies method. It's normal. And now the magic will start. So right here. We didn't write this class. The movies class, even though we wrote the actual class, this is the part that we did not write. There's a nested class that's private seal and it implements the enumerator of, of movie and it's got all this implementation in here. This is code that we never wrote, but it was compiled to this code, right? This is the C sharp lowering feature in this case of get enumerator. So just because you see a method called get enumerator, what I'm trying to get across to you is even though that's just another method, the method is doing a lot of work and it's potentially also creating a new instance of some class that is disposable. So it's, it's not coming for free. And that's the reason why the for each is slightly slower than the for loop. And behind the scenes, the yield return is translating to this. So it's made our life simple. Basically, all this code that is compiler generated at one point, I think before C sharp 3.5, we had to write this code ourselves for the class that we wanted to iterate over without it being kind of automatic. Now with the yield return, it's a lot easier, but the compiled code is still all of this stuff. So there's a lot of code. Of course, there's a lot of movies here, but the reset method is here. The get enumerator method is here. Then we have the state machine to, to get the, the move next and the current. And the state machine actually, it so happens, is very similar to the state machine that gets generated for us when we do async await but that'll be a, another video. So, you know, this is short and sweet. I wanna make sure I don't sort of miss guide people into thinking that you should be using a for loop rather than a for each loop. But as you can see that even a for each loop can potentially translate to a for loop under the hood and or sometimes it uses the get enumerator method for some objects. And sometimes if you want to have, and when you want to build your own, iterating methods or iterating classes where you want to use them in a for loop, you can do that simply by having a method called get enumerator that returns an enumerable of some T that you have. And that's it. The for each just works for you. <laughs> Isn't that cool? All right. So this brings us to the end of this video. And I will see you next time.